God has a word, and it is for me, and it is for you. Amen. Uh, uh, several years ago, I think when I was probably about 15, I was looking through my grandmother's scrapbook, and I came across a, a lot of pictures, uh, seeing my family when they were young, my aunts and uncles when they were kids, and uh, kept on going and going. And then, lo and behold, I saw a, a sports card. It was Babe Ruth wrapped up in saran wrap. And uh, I immediately took it out, and I remember I'd go, gone over to her, and I said, uh, Walita, uh, do, you, do you want this card? And she goes, no, 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 no. You go ahead and have it. I immediately started looking that up, that card up, and it was worth some money. I still have that card to this day. As a matter of fact, it got me collecting sports cards. So if you ever want to see my sports collection, I have a plethora of sports, football, baseball, and even basketball, going all the way back from the 70s, 60s, and even with this Babe Ruth to the 30s. And I'm holding on to it because you can invest in it. Sometimes you, get, you can go to the sports card show and you can trade them and you can get more cards and you can actually even sell them and get some money. And I'm putting them all in this big old box. And I told Samaya, I said, hey, listen, when my time passes, I'm going to give you these. So I want you to hold on to them and invest in them. And she's just got these big old eyes like, mm-hmm, yeah, it's, I'll take real good care of them, Daddy. The first thing I'm going to do is sell all those cards and collect the money. Now, if you think about it, According to this parable, she may have a point. I'll share with you. Uh, today's story is just that. It's a parable that Jesus tells near the end of his life in Matthew's gospel. In fact, some scholars call it an apocalyptic parable. He's given four of these in Matthew's gospel about the kingdom of God and what it's going to look like. And as we know, Jesus is a masterful teacher. He is a rabbi, and he is a master at telling parables. And the way we could define parables is, is more of a lesson it's on spirituality, but also on life. And Jesus opens up the story of a very wealthy man. He is a master who is preparing to go on a long journey. Where is he going? We're not told. That doesn't matter. But before he departs, he calls three of his servants into his office and gives them each a substantial sum of money to take care of while he is gone. To the first servant, he gives five talents. This is what this parable is known for, the parable of the talents. However, talent in our day, in our age, refers to a skill or an ability that someone has. But you have to remember, in Jesus' day, a talent was more of a measurement. In this case, a massive amount of money as much as 15 years of a typical servant's wage, meaning the master gave this servant 80 years of full wages, more than any servant could earn in their lifetime. And so as the scripture, in this case, the message translation says, this first servant is entrusted with $5,000. The second servant is given 2000 and the third is given 1000 and the wealthy man leaves for his journey without providing any instructions on how and when or where to, to handle this money. It's almost like he is trusting his servants to do good with it. But they each thought they knew that their master, they, knew, they each thought they knew their master pretty well, and so they immediately made decisions based upon what they thought this master wanted them to do with it. And so we read the first man takes his talents, his money goes off and begins trading with it. And by the time the master returned, the first servant has doubled the portion of his master's wealth. The second servant has been given $2,000, and he, again, does the very same thing the first servant does. The master comes back, and he has doubled what was originally given to him. And, of course, the master is excited. He is well-pleased at these two servants. As a matter of fact, he says, I'm going to even entrust you more. Like, come and be partners with me. But the third servant, ooh, that third servant, right? Having observed his master and knowing that he was a high standard man who demanded the best, no allowances for error, the story tells us that this third servant was afraid. Perhaps that he felt the responsibility that he had been given was too great. Perhaps he was afraid of, mes uh, of messing up or of making a mistake or of losing his master's wealth. 
And so he took that thousand dollars, which, which he had been entrusted, and he digs a hole in the ground and begins to bury that money for safekeeping. In a way, as you're reading this and hearing this, can you blame the third servant? But we know what the response was with the master. He was angry. Scripture says that he was furious. One of my favorite translations, the CEB reads, he calls him, you evil and lazy servant. But I do like how the message translated it, where that's a terrible way to live. It's criminal to live cautiously like that. Rather than entrusting him with more responsibilities, he tells him to take the thousand and give it back to the one who risked the most. And then he goes on, and get rid of this play it safe who won't go out on a limb, and you got to love these words, throw him into utter darkness. Where is the good news in that? Again, these are pretty harsh words from someone who simply held what was given to him until his master got back. But maybe the, the idea, the hint, lies within the servant's explanation. Again, the servant told the master upon return that he knew the ma- what the master was like and, the, and that he did what he did because he had ultimately been afraid. The servant made assumptions, held beliefs about the master, and acted out of his own fear. I think this may be the key to this parable. And Jesus, of all things, begins this parable by stating how it illustrates the kingdom of heaven. This lazy and supposedly wicked servant, the one who acts out of fear, assumes that the master to be evil himself, to take what isn't his and to reap where he doesn't ultimately sow. Again, given human tendencies to the judgment of others, we may be at risk of reading too much into the fact that the master has the servant sent into utter darkness, a place of what some scholars believe of great suffering. Whatever our interpretation of hell is, and we're going to talk more about that down the stretch in the coming weeks, but in truth, we have to say that acting out of fear and believing we are subject to an evil and unjust, in this case God, will cast us into great suffering, will isolate us from community, will literally put us in that dark place where we are alone feeling that we can't do anything, feeling that no one is for us. We act out of fear, and when we act out of fear, we separate ourselves from everything but that in which we have invested, and that is our God-given identities. Again, we separate ourselves. In writing about the African value system called Ubuntu, literally meaning what it means to be human, Archbishop Desmond Tutu wrote, I need other human beings to be human. The completely self-sufficient human being is subhuman. What does he mean by that? In other words, when we separate ourselves from others, when we act out of fear and close ourselves off to love, compassion, peace, generosity, service, we actually render ourselves as something less than human. A loss of all of that is a loss of of our own humanity. Interesting. If we are called to anything, it is to get right these characteristics, these traits that we look to, that we look to from Jesus to God, in which we profess to believe in the values of what that kingdom represents. And what Jesus' ministry ushered in was just that. It was hope, kindness, love, compassion, service, and generosity. The gospel has been entrusted to us, and we are expected to utilize that and to live consistent with the values of that good news. In this particular case, with these servants, generosity creates influence and impact into the world. At least that's what the parable is teaching us, to make a difference. Not to hold on to things, but to give what pretty much God has given us. But we can't make a difference. You can't make a difference. You cannot influence anything outside of yourself if you keep everything you have for yourself. You can't make a difference if you live your life in fear and isolation in the world and the community around you. Giving of yourself fearlessly, in this case we would say generously, is the key to making that difference. 
I believe that's what that parable, this parable, is teaching us. It is the very definition of what it means to live consistently with the value of what God has called us to live into. And just as in the story of the master who comes back, Jesus indicates that, yes, there will be a time when all of us will get to answer that question. What did you do with the significant gift that I have given you? Let's think about that for a moment. The first thought that, that I thought of was, was, again, I'm always going back to this community and the goodness of what this community continues to do. And one of the saints that has gone before us, and we'll celebrate him next week, is a gentleman by the name of Earl Gilmore. Earl Gilmore, longtime Trinity member, passed away in 2020. But he had been here for years. And one of the things that people can tell you here, those who have been here with Trinity, about Errol Gilmore is that he loved to serve. He loved this community. So much that him and his wife, Beverly, spent many hours cooking and serving downstairs to our neighbors here in the community every Monday for years. So much that they started calling it the Gilmore Lunch. But as he got older and as he began to, to live out his life, he understood that what he had was a great responsibility. And that's what this parable reminded me of. In this case, Errol Gilmore left a legacy. Errol Gilmore was compelled to leave a legacy and to make a difference so much that he left, in this case, his generous amount of money that was not only actually giving us to, uh, 5000 for the Gilmore Choir Fund, Another 5000 for the music fund, 4000 for the AC fund. I can keep on going on and on. And 10000 for Trinity's future fund. Housing an interest-gaining investment account to support Trinity's future. All totaling up to $30,000. Amazing what this man and his legacy continues to do. Now, in this case, Errol knew what he had. And he knew what he was responsible with, and, and he did it. But I don't want us to leave here looking at this as somehow that we need to leave a sum of money, a high amount of money, to make an impact. Because again, what this parable teaches us is what God has given you, whether it's through your finances, whether it's through the gifts that you bring, your service, your prayers. What you have, you have the responsibility to give back. You have the responsibility to share. And so let me ask you, church, what are you doing with what you have been given? Are you using it for the benefit of your community? Are you using it for the benefit of, of, of others in this community? Are you holding on to it, worrying? Are you afraid? I always love meeting with new people. You've always heard me say this. And, and the gifts, I, I always ask you, what, how do you see yourself using your gifts here? And at times, I get it, because I too wonder what gifts I can bring to the table. I, I, don't, I can't sing like Vanessa, but I know Vanessa's going to bring her gifts to Trinity, and she's going to light it up, and we're grateful for that. I can't play the piano, but I know Alan, when we met a year and a half ago, shared with me that I, don't, I can bring my gifts to music. I, when we have our liturgist, when we have folks upstairs doing the tech, it's the hands and the feet of Jesus that we have come, and we're using it, and we're continuing to build off of it. We've been given a lot, and so the question is, what are you holding on? Are you holding on to it too tightly? And how are you willing to give it back so we can continue to build on the kingdom of God? Amen? Amen. So church, let's learn from this parable. It's a hard parable. But at the same time, though, there is truth in this parable, as always in any other parable. What are you holding on to? And are you willing to use it? Use it for the good, for the kingdom of God, like we're continuing to do now today and forevermore. Let's pray.